Some years ago, at a conference, I heard 17 women in a row apologize as they took the microphone. I happened to be taking notes. The first speaker began with, I don't know, but. The next speaker began with, you may not agree with this, but. The next speaker said something like, I don't know what I'm talking about, but here goes. After 17 apologies, I felt angry. I felt, women, we will never make it into the boardrooms of the United States if we can't stand at the podium and deliver the goods. Particular irony of all these 17 apologies and disclaimers was that everybody in the room was invited because they were either a college president, a college dean, or the director of what was considered a major project. It was a women in leadership, academic leadership conference. But because I work at a center for research on women, where we try to put women's experience and perspectives at the center and take women seriously, I had a little talk with myself and said, Peggy, stop being angry at these women. What can you learn from listening to us apologizing? And then I had another point of view. I thought, well, maybe we're doing something quite important with our apologies. When a woman starts out by saying, you may not agree with this, but maybe she's saying, you exist, I exist. My aim is not to persuade you, and we can talk later. I realized that these apologies were, I thought, women's ways of trying to interrupt rhetoric by strengthening this, the social fabric between us before it could be broken by the rhetorical convention, which is, you persuade everybody of your point of view, no matter what they came into the room with, no matter what they came into the forum with. I thought, ah, oh, we're trying to strengthen the social fabric by our apologies and not elevate ourselves with the amplified voice, the opportunity to stand up at the podium. So maybe it's not that we can't stand at the podium. Maybe it's that we can't stand the podium. Maybe we are saying we are bodies in the body of the world, and our aim is not to get on top of each other. But then I got angry again. <laughs> I said, still, OK, fine. That's probably what we're doing. But how are we to get into the centers of power where you have to climb up and prevail? So I thought it was terrible that we were acting so apologetic. And I began to wonder, are we feeling fraudulent at the podium? And I thought, yeah, I think we feel like frauds when we're singled out for special attention and the opportunity to persuade. But then I thought, uh -huh, maybe the fraudulence is in the conventions of the amplified voice and the podium. Maybe the conventions are fraudulent, setting us up to try to work our opinions on others. So I began to say, well, I think it's deplorable that some of us feel more fraudulent than others. If people from some groups feel fraudulent more, other, more often than people from other groups. And at the same time, I think it's applaudable for us to say that a lot of this public speaking stuff, a lot of this being a leader stuff, is a fraud. So which side am I coming out on? Is it deplorable to feel like a fraud or applaudable to feel like a fraud? And I found I was coming out on both sides. 
So how could I make a visual representation of that? Now, you will understand, you will believe, that tutored by the younger generation, I've done my best to keep up with modern technology. <laughs> However, I found the best visual aid I could manage quite old-fashioned, and you don't have to check it at airline security counters. And side one, which is one of the two sides I'm coming out on, says, it's what I think of as the fight song. We must not let them make us feel like frauds. And then, is any group that is trying to make any other group or person feel fraudulent when we stick our heads up in public life and try to wield power. So we must not let them make us feel like frauds is the first side I'm coming out on. The second side, however, does the critique of the culture as a whole. Let us continue to spot fraudulence in the public roles we are asked to play including rules like being an expert, being worthy of special attention, thinking that we're right about what the rest of the world should do. Those are roles we are often encouraged to play. They have fraudulence in them. All over the world, valid human beings are living their lives in ways that they have generated and we haven't generated. And if we're asked to play the role of ex expert, amen, um, we jeopardize ourselves, our nation, and the human reputation. So I'm coming out on both sides. How? Well, it was the Austrian mathematician, Mobius, who discovered that if you take a two-sided thing like this and um, flip it once, that is, twist one side of it, why then you come up with the Mobius strip in which there's only one side and both of the arguments I have made are on that side. So taping it back together, I have a Mobius strip in which I can now run my fingers over my, or I can pass between my thumb and fourth first finger, both exhortations <laughs> in a row, and I will not change sides because they're part of the same analysis. So what is the analysis? I think that in a world filled with pinnacles and pyramids and mountain tops on tops of institutions. As we climb up, the territory is lesser and lesser, and we are taught that only a few can make it. The grading system in college implies that. The promotion system in corporations implies that. The general thinking of the culture of the United States is that the top is narrow. The top is narrow. Part of the protests on Wall Street now and all over the country have to do with how narrow the pinnacles are at the very top. Economically, but also in terms of the academy, who's gonna, how many professors you're allowed to have, maritally, agriculturally. My high-tech visual now is no longer needed. I think as you rise up as an individual, 
in a sector of life or into the kind of role you were taught from early childhood you didn't really deserve or uh, have a chance of holding, then you feel fraudulent. And the problem is, once you've internalized that view that you don't really belong there, because all the indicators are that you don't belong there, then you're at risk. That's internalized oppression when you have drunk in the society's versions of what you're fit to do. That's internalized oppression, and it is a risk to your psychic well-being and to your ability to earn an income or have a family with some degree of confidence that you are okay in your parenting, though not perfect. Perfect parenting is a fraudulent ideal. The risk on the other side is if one does not, if one risks, um, if one sees the fraudulence in the public roles of being, say, an expert or in charge or worthy of the highest grade in the class, unless one understands the many circumstances that went into that, one is at risk of mistaking oneself for the best and the brightest and thinking that one earned everything one's got when in fact there are huge systems of privilege and disadvantage that have a pretty strong predictive power with regard to what we may end up with. So there's the risk in feeling like a fraud, probably not good for our psychic well-being, but there's a risk in being oblivious of the roles and how much they carry of fake fake elevation of just a few to the top of the pinnacle. Having figured that out for myself, I was asked to think again, um, take it further. Because it seemed to me that I had in myself something beyond the roles of fraudulent, feeling fraudulent and um, being seen as a fraud. And I began to want a name for it, and I called it the home self. The home self is a more domestic, conversational, informal part of myself where I feel comfortable and I don't feel like a fraud. And in the home self, for example, I pat the cat and the cat purrs and I don't feel like a fraud. Or I buy chocolate chip ice cream for my grandchildren and they love it and I don't feel like a fraud. It feels natural and normal and it has to do with making and mending the daily fabric without having to strive. And I thought, well, I want to talk about the home self. So the lecture hall was booked. My sponsors were ready. I had huge piles of notes that might go into the subject of the home self, and I couldn't write the talk. I just couldn't write the talk. Clippings, reminiscences, letters from friends couldn't write the talk on my home self. Why couldn't I write the talk? And the night before I had to speak, I realized, for me, what I'm trying to do, which is write the outline of a talk, is fraudulent. For me, the outline itself is fraudulent. My form is the list. The outline makes a fraudulent claim that starting with Roman numeral one and then going into capital A and then little uh, number one and then little a. All of that, I realized, is for me a fraud. I don't think that way. Uh, now I knew why I could never write the topic sentence. I arrive at the topic sentence at the end of the paragraph, if then. <laughs> I realized that my form is the list in which there is no claim to having a place for everything and everything in its place. The list, you can scratch off, add on. The list makes no claim to having a place for everything and everything in its place. And it is part of my home self. And as soon as I realized that, I realized, ah, I'll take a house tour through my own, very own house. And as I travel through the rooms of my very own house in Newton, Massachusetts, I will record how I feel about fraudulence in those different rooms. So I did that. 
Today I have only the chance to tell you about one room in this old Victorian house. It's the top floor. It's the attic. And I found there was a mad woman in the attic. And a mad woman in the attic is very noisy and very exhausting. I have to spend a lot of time taking care of her because she is always haranguing me in one way or another. I go up to her room. She's, always, she's written a lot of little poems. If I start to look at them, she'll say, don't mess with my things. But every now and then, she takes a poem and makes it into a little spitball and sends it down to the second floor. And if I take this wet thing and put it into the wastebasket, she says, I'll kill you if you don't read my poems. <laughs> the night before I was to give the talk, I was stalled in traffic on what's called the um, Southeast Expressway outside Boston. And Mad Woman dictated this poem to me. And it has to do with being authentic. It's just being the home self. I didn't write it, but the Mad Woman is part of the mosaic of floral selves that I have and that you all have. It's fraudulent to settle down on one self, one identity. We are all very multiple, very plural inside. But we also have our convictions about how we matter as a whole. And this is what the mad woman dictated to me on the steering wheel. And I wrote it down as she said it. The prize fish flops and dies. I escape the hooks. I pass through the net. I am the, gen the growing medium water. The prize rose wilts and dies, brushed free of its soil. I am the growing medium earth. The princess swoons over the perfect three-star omelet. I am the steady stove. The jet assumes its power. I am the air, the necessary body for its rise and its descent. Water, earth, fire, air. I am the genuine element. Trust me. Thank you.